Text Talks. Hi, everyone. Today's Text Talk mini lecture um, is about the Buddhist Sangha. Okay, um, as with our other mini lectures, um, there's um, some slides that you can be looking at as you're listening to me talk. So if you look at the slideshow, look at slide number two. Um, and um, what I want to bring to attention from the very beginning is the Sangha. The Sangha basically refers to the Buddhist monastery. And one of the things that's really interesting to think about is that the Sangha is the oldest monastic tradition in the world. The Buddhist Sangha is older than any Christian monasteries or any monasteries um, from any other religious tradition. And in fact, um, if you think about it, it might very well be the world's oldest continuing organization of any kind. Um, now, I think, broadly speaking, we think of the Sangha um, as the community of monks and nuns. Um, it was intended to be an ideal community, providing an atmosphere of spiritual growth. So this idea that if you're, if you're following the Buddhist path, that if you surround yourself with other people following the Buddhist path who are abiding by the same sort of lifestyle and rules and regulation, that you are more likely to continue your own spiritual development. Um, sangha is uh, originally a Sanskrit word that actually has wider implications. It means a crowd or a gathering. Um, but in a Buddhist context, it refers specifically to the community of monks and nuns and does not refer to the lay followers. Now, in this slide, I have um, two pictures of um, Buddhist monasteries. One um, is one of the oldest, um, that's Sanchi in India, in Madhya Pradesh. Um, that's in the top right-hand corner of the slide. And you'll see that, you know, these are, you know, that, that Sanchi's in ruins. These are just the ruins that have remained um, today, and it was once a thriving monastery. Um, but you can see that, that, you know, that, I mean, and this picture is only really part of the remains, that it was on... Um, you know, it, it would have consisted of several buildings, and we can imagine um, that it would have been a very vibrant place. Um, I also have um, a, um, a drawing of a Buddhist monastery in Japan. Um, this one is called Eheji. Um, if you listen to last week's text talks on meditation, you might remember I talked about the Soto school of Zen Buddhism, and Eheji is the main monastery of the Soto school. Um, I, um, I, I included this picture here because I've spent um, quite a bit of time at Eheji myself, and so much of my understanding of a Buddhist monastery comes from having visited Eheji. And in fact, um, the next several slides I've just sort of included some of my own pictures of a Heiji, just so you can see um, how big of a place this is, um, you know, how many different buildings there are. Um, it's also, um, you can see how it's really, um, you know, it's built in a rather remote place, um, you know, away from towns and cities where monks can really sort of retreat and live this idealistic life, um, usually in a monastery, um, in addition to the, the quarters where the monks and or nuns live. You also have a prayer hall, you have a meditation hall, you have um, an eating hall. Um, some monasteries are very vibrant places, others much more austere and silent places. 
that a lot depends on which tradition of Buddhism. Okay, now going all the way ahead to our next slide with content on it, um, slide number 10, I want to bring attention to some of the social dimensions of a Buddhist monastery. Because on the one hand, <coughs> you know, Buddhist monasteries are mainly for monks and nuns. But on the other hand, through time, we've seen that they have taken on other roles. Um, so we, I have this great quotation about um, in rural Thailand that Buddhist, a Buddhist temple is the center of lay Buddhism as well. So even though um, you know, the, the lay Buddhists aren't officially considered part of the Sangha, um, it doesn't mean that they're not very much um, interacting with the Sangha um, and very much you know, participating in the life of the monastery in one way or another. Um, so in rural Thailand, um, it can be a place for town hall meetings, it can be a school, a hospital. Um, monks provide herbal medicine um, and take care of the sick. Um, it can be a social and recreation center, a playground for children, an inn for visitors and travelers, a warehouse for keeping boats and other communal objects, and even a wildlife refuge. Um, and I think that that this sort of multi, um, you know, purpose, you know, the way in which the a Buddhist mon monastery serves the community in multiple ways is something that, um, that we've seen throughout Buddhist history. Um, and so on this slide, I also have a picture of Nalanda, um, which was um, founded in the 5th century in India and flourished until about the 12th century. And, you know, the Nalanda was much more of a university than it was a monastery. It was monastic in some ways because it was primarily a Buddhist organization and monks and nuns would live there and they would be basically, you know, living um, according to the monastic rules and regulations. But far more than just Buddhists lived there and visited there. And they would have had a curriculum that involved more than just Buddhist teachings. And so we can see that in the history of the Buddhist monastery, um, that it has been far more than just a religious center or just a place um, that's only for monks and nuns. Um, also, in the history of Buddhism, um, not only has the monastery functioned as a university, it's also functioned as a bank. Um, there's a very interesting um, YouTube lecture about that that I've um, included in, um, in the bibliography on this slideshow that I'd, um, by uh, the great Buddhist scholar Gregory Chopin, that I would um, very much recommend you looking at. Um, but one of the things that, that's really interesting about that is that we wouldn't normally think of the Buddhist monastery operating in that way. We think of Buddhism as uh, a religion that's teaching us to get rid of our possessions, to extract ourselves from everyday life. Um, but in ancient times, particularly because monks were considered to be trustworthy, because it was considered to be an organization that was protected and, and, and trusted and, and also um, one that endured through time. It was a place that people felt comfortable leaving their money um, and investing in. Um, and also another thing that, you know, that the, um, that, Buddhist monasteries have contributed to is the history of medicine. Um, there have been some interesting studies showing that um, some of the oldest Indian med medical traditions really were thriving um, in Buddhist monasteries as well. Um, so let's look at our next slide, slide 11, um, and um, we see that um, a little bit of the history of the monastery. So initially, within the lifetime of the Buddha, it seems that um, 
even though there was a Sangha, the Sangha referred to the monastic community, but it didn't necessarily, the Sangha wasn't in a fixed location. Um, originally, Buddhist monks and nuns were mendicants who would only settle in one place during the rainy season. So um, from our oldest sources, it seems that our first Buddhists were, um, were wanderers and lived a life of wandering and begging for alms. Um, however, it seems that the Buddhist monastery was formed sometime during the first few generations after the Buddha's demise. Um, and, you know, in our oldest sources, Buddhists were prohibited from observing the retreat um, in the open air, in a hollow tree, in a graveyard, under an umbrella, or in an earthware salt jar. So in other words, we see that some of the oldest rules about monks and nuns were about where they should and where they shouldn't spend time during the rainy season. But over time, these sorts of rules became less important because there was this physical permanent monastery for them to go to. So what's the life like for monks and nuns? Well, basically, there are you know, two stages. One um, is leaving the world, basically um, you know, giving up one's attachments to this world and and um, you know, st um, st like stopping, you know, kind of living in a house and holding a job, etc., and then being ordained. Um, and you know, they're um, an initiate, somebody um, who wants to become a monk or a nun, has to be at least eight years old and cannot be a full um, monk or nun until they're at the age of 20. Um, now, there are 10 rules that all monks and nuns have to follow. One is um, no murder, no injury to others. Two, no theft. Um, three, no impurity, um, particularly um, no sexual relations. Um, four, no falsehood, no telling lies. Fifth, no liquor or drugs. Um, six, no meals after midday. Um, um, th th this one isn't necessarily completely followed in all monasteries, but still, most monasteries are pretty strict about when meals are. Um, number seven, no dancing, music, or entertainments. Number eight, no garlands, perfumes, and unguents. Nine, no luxurious bedding. And ten, no use of gold or silver. Um, so these are the rules that all monks and nuns are supposed to follow. Now, um, I'd encourage you to do a little bit more reading in the primary sources by looking at some of the oldest texts about how monks and nuns should live. Um, as we discussed in the lecture on Theravada texts, um, the, the, the group of texts that contain um, the rules and regulations for monks and nuns are called the Vinaya. Um, and there are two main sections of the Vinaya, the Sutta Vibhanga, and the Khandaka. And in the Sutta Vibhanga, we have the oldest section, which is called the Patimoka, which are the list of monks, of rules for monks and nuns. Um, this is considered um, the oldest section. And one of the interesting things about that is the, the Patimoka continues to be chanted amongst a number of Buddhist communities up until today. Um, so, the, you know, so in other words, um, not only do monks and nuns still abide by these rules, but they still chant these rules as part of their Buddhist practice. Um, now, another thing that's interesting about the Vinaya is that we not only get a number of rules for monks and nuns, but we also get the story of the origin of um, the ordination of nuns. What's interesting about this story is that it shows that, that early on amongst the first Buddhists, 
there was a bit of ambivalence about whether there should be an order of nuns or not. Um, you know, we have no idea whether this story um, is a true account or not, but according to this story, the Buddha's aunt um, um, basically came to him and, you know, asked for there to be an order of nuns. Initially, the Buddha rejected this, saying that, um, um, that basically that, that it will, um, you know, that the Buddhism won't last as long if there are nuns. Um, um, finally, the, you know, she gives up trying to persuade the Buddha. She goes to Ananda, who's um, the Buddha's sort of right-hand man, and then Ananda goes and is able to convince the Buddha to have an order of nuns. Um, but I know that there's some good um, questions about women in Buddhism and, and Buddhism and gender. And I think that if you're in, um, that this story about the um, origin of the order of nuns in Buddhism is perhaps a good place to go to, um, to be able to address some of those sorts of questions. Okay, so that, you know, that's a real overview, a real quick overview about the Buddhist Sangha, particularly about um, the history of the Buddhist monastery. And um, in the final slide I have in this slideshow is, as usual, a, um, a list of some background reading and further references so you can learn more. Okay, thank you very much.